All right, welcome everybody to your next training course. Uh, we're gonna be covering confined space. Uh, this is gonna include the authorized entrant, the attendant, and then your area monitor or your area supervisor. Um, when going through this course, I'd recommend you take notes for this one. Um, pay special note to what the actual definition of a confined space is, okay? So that's gonna consider three things. I want you to take some extra notes and pay attention. You really want to understand the difference between a permit and a non-permitted confined space. What is the difference? What do you have to do to prove that difference? Um, and then what are the, the difference in dangers or hazards? And then I want you guys to pay attention to the roles and responsibilities of each task. So if you're an entrant, what do you need to know? What do you need to be trained on? The attendant and then the area supervisor. All right, good luck. We're going to get into the PowerPoint. Uh, pay attention. Okay, so you should be looking at my confined space PowerPoint. Um, let's dip right in. So certain things you got to understand is the objective for a course like confined space is to help employees and the employers um, understand the criteria of a confined space. What is it? What does it actually define as? It's to motivate you to evaluate your workplace written programs and keep in mind that's done on an annual basis. So every single year, you got to dust off the binder and review the written program, make changes where necessary. Things are still implemented, go for it, update and delete. So there's really three things that define a confined space according to the OSHA standard. And you have to say yes to all three things for this to be considered a confined space. And we'll talk about the differences between permitted and non-permitted spaces and things you should know. But the actual basic definition of a confined space first, it says it's large enough and so configured that a person or an employee can bodily enter and perform assigned work. If you cannot fit into the space by definition, it's no longer considered a confined space. It's just a real tight space. It's a small space, but a confined space, your whole body got to be able to fit in there. That's definition one. Two, it says it has limited or restricted means for entry or exit. Now, it doesn't say it has one door. It doesn't say it has one opening. And that's where a lot of people get confused. It says has limited or restricted means for entry or exit. You can have two doors, but if an active shooter showed up at one of them, everybody is forced to exit out the other door. That's still considered limited. Picture yourself in a room that had 10 doors, but if all 10 doors are on one side of the room and that wall's on fire, you're still out of luck, right? So limited or restricted. Restricted can actually mean the size of the opening. You can be in, in a giant honeycomb that had 100 holes, but if the diameter of the hole was only 12 inches, it's restricted for certain workers to access and get in and out. Therefore, it's considered limited or restricted. And then the final definition, it says it's not designed for continuous employee occupancy. Basically, they're telling you it's not designed for you to live in. Your home would not be considered a confined space because it's designed for you to live in. Now, if this space had a bathroom and a kitchen and a bed, then you may be looking back at, well, this is designed for it to be lived in. Uh, it's no longer a space. As long as you identify and say yes to all three, you are now working within a confined space. Just picture your office, even your office trailer you have there. Um, it is large enough for somebody to fit in there and do work. It has limited or restricted means for entry or exit, but it's not designed, and it's also not designed, right, for you to live there. So your office trailer that you guys have in the warehouse is technically a confined space by definition. Here are some other examples of confined spaces like pipe chases. Um, you have crawl spaces. You have things like manholes. Uh, manholes is the more common type of confined space. Things like these are typically permit required, but we'll kind of get into the differences as far as the definition. Um, and then pits, right? So look at this, it says types of confined space. Realistically, you only have two. A non-permitted space, if you read it says, does not contain a physical, chemical, or atmospheric hazard capable of causing death or serious physical harm. And on the other hand, a permitted does, right? 
a non-permitted space is very common and you see them everywhere. Obviously a permitted basically tells you it has one of these many hazards. And realistically, when you look into it, you can make anything a permitted space, but your job is to prove to OSHA that it is no longer a permitted space because we've handled all the, all the dangers. If it was dangerous in there because of heat and we introduced something cool to it, we eliminated that hazard. Therefore, it doesn't need the permit anymore. Um, but you really need to understand that they get very particular sometimes. And that's what we're going to cover here in the PowerPoint. So taking a look at this, this is similar to just like a regular flow chart. Um, but if you stop, start at the top left box here, those are the same three definitions that are a confined space. So again, you have to answer yes to all three. Is it large enough for you to enter? Does it have limited or restricted means in and out? And is it designed or it's not designed for continuous occupancy? If I said yes, 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 I'm calling it a confined space. If I said no, it's not a confined space, right? And then if you move down to confined space, you notice the four items right below it. They all say or. So confined space, does it have a hazardous atmosphere? And that could be to the lack of oxygen. That could be a presence of other gases. If you had carbon monoxide from a generator, if you had acetylene gas from a cutting torch, um, if you had hydrogen sulfite, that's uh, H2S, that's from rotten eggs, smell from uh, decomposition of human waste. All of those are hazardous atmospheres. If you said yes, then it requires a permit. The basic permit requirement is it tells the entrant or the employee who's going to be going inside, hey, you know what? This is the danger. Here's the hazard. Make sure you're aware of the hazard because you may have to protect yourself or it may be a, a non-entry kind of space. The next one down says, does it have an engulfment hazard? An engulfment hazard, uh, if I'm working in a trench, like an excavation, and I can get caved in by, by dirt, that would be an engulfment hazard, right? I can get swallowed up by the dirt. Uh, if you said yes, it requires a permit. And the permit will just tell you, okay, well, use things to prevent a cave-in, such as sloping back the hill, um, using shoring, using a trench shield box while you're in the excavation. The next one now says, is it a configuration hazard? You know, I've got to work on the electrical panel, but I have to walk through this giant metal fan blade assembly, or I got to walk underneath a hydraulic door. Is it a configuration hazard to where if something happened, I could get caught in between, I could get struck by, um, I could get smashed, right? And then that last one right there at the bottom, unfortunately, is OSHA's little catch-all. And the catch-all means any other recognized serious hazard. I'll give you an example. Here's why they call it a catch-all. You can realistically make any non-permitted space a permit. If I dropped something as simple as like a pencil on the ground and somebody stepped and slipped on the pencil and then they fell and hit their head, that could cause serious physical injury or death, which states it should be a permit required confined space. Now, obviously, they're not looking for reasons um, to make it one. But in the same sense, don't try and have the pissing contest with the OSHA inspector um, who's going to come out and, and hopefully not write you any violations, right? So any other safety hazard, if you had somebody who was allergic to bees or, or bee stings, a bee can fly anywhere. A bee can land on my shirt and I can walk it right into the work area. And if it stings somebody, they could experience anaphylaxis. They could have difficulty breathing. Um, and that is a serious safety hazard, which says, okay, well, then you need a permit, right? So they keep that open-ended. You just want to make sure that, you know what, we evaluated everything we're going to be doing in the space. Um, we check the hazardous atmosphere. There's no engulfment hazard. We, we determine there's no configuration hazard. And yes, even though a bee could fly in and, you know, poke you in the eye, which would be really bad, um, realistically, it's not going to happen. So that's where you determine, you know what, no permit is required. Now, for you guys, I understand that you already have your permits written out, which is great. Okay, So you fill it out like a job app, and basically that's the piece of paper showing any inspector who, who walks in, yeah, you know what, they've evaluated the space, they've done their appropriate monitoring, and we can all conclude it no longer requires a permit to enter. 
Now, when you look at uh, 1926.21, 1926 reminds us that it is a construction industry standard. Um, Section 21B6I tells you exactly where it states this specific phrase, which says, all employees required to enter into a confined or an enclosed space shall be instructed as to the nature and the hazards involved, the necessary precautions to be taken, and in the use of protective and emergency equipment required. This is the section that tells you why you're watching this video, why I'm gonna print you a piece of paper with your name on it that says certify, right? You need to have the training if you're gonna be entering into an enclosed or a confined space. It also states that the employer shall comply with any specific regulations that apply to work in dangerous or potentially dangerous area. So if there's a hazardous atmosphere, and it regulates that you ventilate the space, the employer has to make sure the space is ventilated. You can't just send your guys in and, and call it a day, right? The employer is responsible to make the space safe. Now, if you guys are gonna be doing things like hot work, uh, welding, cutting, heating in, in the confined space, you have to use some type of ventilation. It's just mechanical or local exhaust ventilation meeting the requirements of paragraph A, which basically means it has enough of a flow or an exchange rate to keep the air in a uh, normal quality. And we'll talk about what is normal air as far as percentages go. When sufficient ventilation cannot be obtained without blocking the means for access, the employees in the confined space shall be protected by airline respirators. Now, that's if you're gonna run a blower and the yellow ducting that goes down into the manhole is gonna block the only way in and out, then you have to use an airline respirator, which become really expensive. They're called, you know, well, they have powered air purifying respirators, but an airline is an SAR, it's a supplied air respirator, which means you would have to use air compressors outside of the space, run hoses down into the space directly to your full face mask, and those get really expensive. I mean, you're talking a two-man system, $20,000, and I haven't seen anybody use those because it is not cost-effective. And then it says an employee outside of such a confined space assigned to maintain communication with those working within it and to aid them in emergency. That is when you need a whole watch or when you need somebody outside is when it becomes a permit-required confined space. you, you got to have a whole watch. If you were doing those hot work, like cutting, welding, and heating, it's where lifelines come into play. It's where a worker must enter a confined space through a manhole or other small opening uh, means and shall be provided for quickly removing them in the event of an emergency. This is when you start to see the tripods over the hole when you're doing hot work because there's a possibility of heat stroke, heat exhaustion. You could just be creating the hazardous atmosphere by cutting, burning, or torching they have to use a fall protection harness and be tied off to something that can remove them from the space. When safety belts and lifelines are used for this purpose, um, they shall be attached to the welder's body so that his body cannot be jammed in a small exit or opening. So if you remember from fall protection, when you're putting on a full body harness, it recommends that the lowest you wear the D-ring is between your shoulder blades. If you were to wear it any lower, when it starts to pull you up, you're actually gonna be essentially parallel with the ground, and I may not be able to get you out of the small manhole opening. So you wanna remain as vertical as possible for a confined space rescue. And then your attendant who's outside with a pre planned rescue procedure. This is uh, one of those where they come and they start speaking with your attendant. They say, hey, what is your rescue plan in the event there's an emergency? When they start saying, I don't know, it means that you haven't planned out your confined space correctly. So make sure they're aware of it. Even if it's something as simple as, I'm going to dial 911, I am going to crank him out of the hole, and then I'm going to perform CPR until medical help arrives. That, that is your rescue plan, but you have to have it, A, not only the, the worker has to be trained, but B, remember OSHA's motto, if it's not in writing, it does not exist. So you have to have it in writing somewhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be on the job, but I'll tell you what, 
it looks a lot better when it's there because your workers can always reference back. To you. Okay, so let's look at the uh, permit required confined space. Remember, we already know what a confined space is. It's large enough for me to fit in it. It has limited ways for me to get in and out of it, and then it is not designed for continuous occupancy. That means I don't live there. A permit required confined space, if you look, it says contains or has potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere. That means it's already there, or because of the work I'm doing, I'm drilling a hole into this gas line, it may have potential to now contain a hazardous atmosphere. It contains material that has potential for engulfing an entrance. Again, like an excavation, you're digging a trench, or maybe I'm in a silo and, and it can be filled with corn, or it can be filled with water and I can be engulfed by that material. It also has an internal configuration. Remember, this is a configuration hazard such as an entrant could be trapped or asphyxiated by inward conveying walls or by floors which slope downward and taper to a smaller cross section. And then that last one is the catch-all. It contains any other serious safety or health hazard. Okay, so here are some examples of permit required confined spaces. You see a, a manhole on the top left, you got some silos, you got some rusted pipe, um, some sewer lines, water lines, things like that. Now rust is a chemical reaction that actually absorbs the oxygen out of the air, making it deficient. And that's where it becomes dangerous. So yes, the rust can be dangerous, especially if there is no free flowing air. So let's take a look at the actual entry procedures. If you are gonna be going into a permit required confined space, this is what has to be done. First, you need to conduct an assessment. And this is done obviously before anybody goes in there, but you have to assess the situation. Is it dangerous? How dangerous is it? How long are we gonna be there? What are the possible hazards? The what if, right? Number two, you have to post up signage and barricade off the area. Barricading off the area is to keep anybody unwanted away from the danger. And then you post signage at the entrances so that before somebody enters, they have the opportunity to read, hey, you know what? Caution, permit required confined space, authorized entry only. You write the permit, again, for, for Pacific Com, you guys already have the permit written. Um, you just got to fill out the permit. You perform all pre-entry tests, and that's going to be done with a gas monitor if you have your own gas monitor, um, which you guys still should. Remember, your gas monitor typically needs to be daily fresh air calibrated prior to each use. And then every six months, the manufacturer typically requires that you have it sent and recalibrated through them. Okay? Um, you want to follow all other safety procedures, so utilizing the correct personal protective equipment. Um, using lockout tagout and then ventilation of the space if required. Continuing on, if you see, it says you should do a pre entry briefing. That's going to be with all the workers involved with the project, including subcontractors. You're basically discussing the work that's going to be done. Number seven, it says you perform entry and you do that work that was discussed. Eight, you perform continuous atmospheric tests. So your gas monitor especially if you're already in a permitted space or there's a potential for a hazardous atmosphere, you want to be testing it constantly because as soon as that thing detects something um, out of the permissible exposure limit, it's going to sound the alarm. There's typically three alarms, right? You get a vibration from the machine, you get a high-pitched alarm squealing sound, and then you normally get flashing red lights. It's in case it's too loud, it's too bright, it's too dark, I had vibration, I didn't feel it. It gives you three different opportunities to get out of the hole. Um, you should exit the space, and obviously that's when you're done, or if you're called out. Uh, number 10, it says debrief the employees and co uh, contractors. This is done by the area supervisor. If you have anybody in the hole, you need to make sure you do a debriefing that basically discuss the success of the work. How did it go? Did you realize or see anything in there that maybe shouldn't have been in there? And then number 11, it says verify completion. Now, similar to a fire watch, the area supervisor should remain at the site for at least 30 minutes after work is complete 
uh, to verify there's no existing, you know, there's no fires. Everything was done correctly. We've turned the valves back off. This is sealed off for the day until we come tomorrow. So all those things need to be done. You all should be, should be concerned about ventilation consideration. Ventilation should not create an additional hazard. The problem they see on a lot of job sites is you use an electric blower, which needs to be, you know, plugged in. And blowers can work either two ways. You can blow fresh air into the space from outside, or you can suck the bad air from inside of the space out, right? Typically, you blow fresh air into the space. It's a little more effective, but if you're using an electric blower and you have your gas generator sitting next to it because you plugged it in for power, a lot of times you're creating the additional hazard by sucking in that, all that carbon monoxide and blowing it into the space. So you need to be very aware of that before that happens. Okay, looking here. You should be able to identify categories of the confined spaces. You have things like open top spaces that have a depth that will restrict the natural movement of air. Now there is a estimated um, best practice depth is four feet. I say basically saying, all right, well, it's deep enough to where free flowing air is not gonna be blowing through here, clearing the space. Or you have an enclosed space that has limited or no openings um, maybe just the door entry, and then you get in and it's sealed. So these are different categories they identify. Okay, so uh, natural ventilation. The lack of air movement in and out of the space can create atmospheres much different than the outside atmosphere. Uh, deadly gases can be trapped inside. Organic materials can decompose. And then it may not be enough oxygen um, due to the presence of other gases or chemicals. Um, such as rusting. Right? Gases that are heavier than air, like butane, propane, and other hydrocarbons, they remain in depressions and will flow to the low points where they're difficult to remove. And then things like water tanks, they appear harmless, but they develop hazardous atmospheres, um, such as hydrogen sulfide, and that's from the vaporization of contaminated water. So your wastewater treatment plants, um, those <laughs> real stink areas, it stinks at a low concentration, but at high concentrations, they're actually odorless and colorless. So you got to watch out for that as well. So this is showing hydrogen sulfide. Um, the important thing, and I'm going to highlight it here, is this is what OSHA based a lot of their information off of. Permissible exposure level, because it'll always give you an amount. So for example, this is 10 parts per million of air of hydrogen sulfide is your permissible exposure level, which basically means it's time for eight hours. So at 10 parts per million, you can legally work for eight hours. That's 40 hours a week, 2,000 hours a year, and you will have no long-term health effects. But if this number starts to go up, right, you have to reduce the amount of time you can actually work in the space. This is showing how fast it would affect you. Greater than 1,000 unconsciousness and death in just minutes, right? So PELs are, are for everything. There's a PEL for silica and asbestos, and how much can I breathe of this aerosol spray? How much WD-40 can I get exposed to? Permissible exposure limits is what you need to watch as far as exposure. So this is just saying like carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide, it's an odorless, colorless gas and it's a combustion byproduct, right? So if you have a car sitting idling where you guys are working and all that is going into your space, it gives you a PEL of 50 part per million over the eight hour time weighted average, right? So in an eight hour day. Your Honda generator that you may have in a space, I think you can get, you know, in this range in 30 minutes. But it's telling you in 30 minutes, uh, well, you would be unconscious, right? <laughs> you would not be exiting the space on your own power. Um, and then it basically kills you. Carbon monoxide absorbs into your, your blood, into your body, into your cells, into your lungs, and it makes it so you cannot absorb oxygen. That's why it's dangerous. So let's go into the characteristics of a confined space. So the characteristics basically, 
you have to be able to identify whether it is an open space and an or an obstructed space, right? An open space has no obstacles, barriers, or obstructions within it. That means if a rescuer was going to come bring a stretcher to you, they don't have to go over or around anything. Okay? It's open or it's obstructed. And obstructed basically means they got to maneuver, right? They're, they're going to have to figure out a way to get to you. So you should be able to identify that at the very least. Then what you want to be able to identify is, is it elevated or non-elevated? Elevated means the only point for access or entry is above a four-foot mark, and non-elevated is just below that four-foot mark. The reason why this is important for you to know is um, <clears throat> rescue. If you're unconscious and you're passed out, and now i got to not only get you in a space, i got to lift you and carry you and maybe push you out of a five-foot tall window, it becomes more dangerous, more hard, and more demanding. Okay? So first one is, is it open or is it obstructed? Open means there's nothing that's ever going to be in your way. And then elevated or non-elevated. Elevated means your entry point is above the four-foot mark. Okay? So what we're going to do here is you're going to see me set a timer. We're going to take a short 10-minute break so you can get up, you can stretch, you can do whatever you want. Uh, it's going to keep playing. If you don't want to take a 10-minute break, then you just fast forward through. But we're going to take a short 10-minute break and then continue on with the PowerPoint. So you'll see what's going down here. I'm going to set that little timer for you, and we'll see you in 10 minutes.
Okay, so I lied. I'm going to dip back into the PowerPoint. If you still need to take a break, you can just pause the video. Um, but other than that, we're going to get rolling again. In five minutes, you'll see a little notification pop up on the screen, but it's okay. I will try my best to flick it away as fast as possible. Okay. Continuing on with the characteristics, it's going to ask, or you need to know if it is a restricted or an unrestricted entrance. A restricted means it's less than or equal to 24 inches or two feet. The reason why this is important to know, and, and unrestricted is obviously just bigger, is if you look, it says openings as small as 18 inches in diameter are considered restricted. It's going to be difficult to enter with an SCBA or life-saving equipment. SCBA is what a firefighter wears on their back, and a self-contained breathing apparatus, similar to a scuba tank, which would be a self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. They won't be able to fit through the hole wearing their own protective equipment, and they are not going to die to come grab you while you're dying. Right? So you need to, on the phone, your person who's calling 911 should be able to identify all the characteristics. It is obstructed, it is elevated, and it is restricted. Then they're going to know, wow, it's going to be a very special type of rescue we're going to be performing here. Take a look at these three gentlemen. In confined space, there are three essential positions you can be. You can be an authorized entrant, and that's going to be the person going in the space. If we look, we can automatically assume who that's going to be, right? Even though he's wearing his harness wrong because his chest strap is around his stomach, not at the nipples, apparently has a broken collarbone because this is adjusted about an inch and a half off as far as his left and right shoulder go. One of the things about your entrant is not only are they supposed to be trained in confined space, they have to be trained in all the equipment that's going to be used, like the rescue SCBA he has on his back, which means he has to be trained in the respirator and proper care and maintenance and storage, and then in the fall protection equipment. Right? He has to be familiar with how the blower works and, and how the guardrail system in the background is set up, how the tripod works. You got to train them in everything. You also have a area superintendent. And in this picture, if you wanted to assume, we're going to assume the guy with the blue full brim hard hat instead of the red, right? He's got almost a collared shirt here. Yeah, you know, so he's the superintendent. And right now it looks like he's reviewing the permit with the entrant. Here are the hazards. Here are why you're, you're tying off. Here's why we gave you a rescue SCBA. And then the guy on the left-hand side, obviously, is going to be your attendant, your whole watch, or at least the guy who's seen the guy taking the picture with the little flex going on over here. So here's what your attendant has to know. This is the individual stationed outside of one or more, more permitted spaces who monitors authorized entrance and performs all attendees' duties assigned in the employer's permit space program. And that's why it's, it's reviewed annually. If it doesn't make sense, you have to update your permit required confined space written program is one of the things that someone like OSHA or HIOSH would request. They're going to request the employee certifications and training. But they're going to be looking at, okay, well, what are the jobs of the attendant? We noticed he was at the work truck in the toolbox, not standing above the hole. In your space, it says he won't ever leave the hole. And then you kind of shoot yourself in the foot based on not following your own policy. They should know the hazards that are going to be faced during entry. So aware, you know, okay, well, he's going to be dealing with um, electrical wires. He's going to be dealing with an engulfment hazard down there. They have to know anything that might happen in the hole. They have to be aware of possible behavioral effects. And that's going to be to the presence of, like, other gases or lack of oxygen. You get people to start to act loopy or funny. And the only way your tenant's going to do that is to maintain communication with those working in the space, whether it's verbal communication or you use radios, you use whistles or air horns. But you have to have some type of communication, and that's also going to be identified in the permit that you guys fill out. It'll say, what is your means of communication? If you put, we're going to yell real loud, then you should be yelling real loud, right? To, hey, how you doing in there, Johnny? You got to yell real loud. That's all, that's all it breaks down to. You have to continuously maintain an accurate count of authorized entrance. If OSHA shows up and they say, how many guys are in the hole? Ten. 
Okay, call them out. And eight people come out. That means two people died, right? Or two people didn't hear you. Or if it was inaccurate, that means you did not maintain an accurate count. And they're going to tag you for what's called a willful violation. That means you know you should have did it. You didn't do it. And a willful violation can be $138,000 for a first offense. And that's for per person. That's big dollars. You're not going to be wanting to cut a check to the state of Hawaii because then they're going to attempt to patch, patch some potholes or something with it, right? And then the last one, it says, you remain outside of the permitted space during operations until relieved by another attendant. If you have to use the bathroom, you better call somebody else to come watch the hole while um, and then you go. If, you, if not, you call the guys out of the hole or you tell them heads up. Either way, you cannot leave the hole with any men in there. So looking at the, the um, actual duties, communicate with the entrant, monitor activities inside and outside of the space, summon rescue. You can perform non-entry rescues. That's going to be on the tripod and pulling the guy out. And perform no duties that might interfere with your primary duty, which is watching the guy in the hole. Okay. So let's look at the authorized entrance. Authorized means an employee who is authorized by the employer to enter a confined space. In your case, Pacific Comtech said, I can go in the hole. That means I'm an authorized entrant. They should also know the hazards that are going to be faced during entry, including information on signs or symptoms or, and consequences of exposure, how to properly use the equipment. So I talked to you about having to know how to use everything, right? and then communicate with the attendant so that the attendant can monitor your status. That's all the duties of the entrant. They have to alert an attendant if you recognize any serious warning sign or symptom of exposure. If you detect a prohibited condition, like, you know what, we're supposed to cut the power, but there's still power down here. There's still lights down here. The water is still running. Um, and then you should exit from this confined space whenever the uh, order to evacuate is given by the attendant or the supervisor. If you recognize a warning sign or symptom of exposure, if you detect a prohibited condition, or if you hear the evacuation alarm. So remember is yes, you communicate when you see something dangerous, but at the same time, you also get out of the hole when one of those things happen um, so that it doesn't affect you and we can handle or take care of the situation prior to re-entry. So take a look at this uh, photo here. This photo has a lot of um, questionable things. There's some goods, there's some bads, but remember the way that OSHA works is they are gonna ask you every single question they can to get you to slip up. For example, when I'm looking at this, I notice that, you know what, your guy on your right hand side has a full Tyvek suit here, non-breathable, even though he's wearing it incorrectly because his hood's not on. And this guy has a regular t-shirt on. Why is he wearing a non-breathable suit? So hopefully your answer is, ah, you know what, Johnny, he doesn't like to get dirty. It's just to protect him from mud. Because if you say, well, it's because the soil is contaminated or it has lead-based paint flakes in it, then the other guy's not protecting himself. They're going to ask about access and egress. Because this is actually defined as an excavation, right, that they're going in, you need to provide access and egress within, four, or within 25 feet of the worker but anything deeper than four feet, they're definitely deeper than four feet unless they're Oompa Loompas, right? But they have, if you see tripod footing, they have a chain connected to a pump ear hook, or it's basically a large carabiner with straps that go to the chest D-ring of both workers. So they actually get pulled up together on the chain, face to face, awkwardly, right, in the dark, um, but that's their access and egress. They're going to say, well, this is also a fall hazard for anybody working above. And you should point out here at the top of the screen that the guy's wearing a harness, right? He has a little blue and black leg strap. You can't see it too well, but he's wearing a harness to prevent him from falling and hitting the ground. They're going to say, hey, there's a blower in there. What are you using the blower for? Now, if you say, 
I'm using the blower to keep my workers cool just to avoid heat stroke and heat exhaustion. That'd be a good answer, right? But if you say, I'm using the blower to flush out all the hazardous air that's in there, then they're going to start questioning even more, right? Well, what kind of hazardous air? What is the uh, parts per million of that hazardous air? What happens when the blower breaks? What happens if the generator that's powering the blower runs out of gas? What are you going to do? You could say, oh, well, we're going to crank our guy out, put our rescue plan into place, call 911. Or you could say, you know what, we're going to toss these guys down respirators, but make sure whatever it is you say, it's true and it's in writing and you can back it up. Because I can tell you what, this guy probably can wear a respirator, but this guy definitely can't, right? He has a full beard. 29 CFR 1910 134, it says that if you're going to wear a full face or a half face tight fitting respirator, no hair can come in between the seal of the mask and your face. It also cannot interfere with the movement of the one way valve. So I can't just say, I'm going to throw him a respirator when he legally shouldn't even wear a respirator, right? So don't get yourself um, caught in a situation you shouldn't be in. And then the entry supervisor, the easiest way to look at this is the supervisor has to know everything, right? Warning signs, symptoms of exposure, they have to be able to be an authorized entrant. They have to be able to be an attendant and they can serve as that as long as they're trained in the duties of that specific job and that specific task, they're allowed to do all these kind of things. The supervisor, again, knows the hazards and the warning signs and symptoms. We can ignore that and mark that randomly just <laughs> went on there. Um, they verify by checking all appropriate, um, all appropriate entries have been made on the permit. So the tests were documented. Um, all of the tests were conducted. You check for error, you check for the explosive gases. We check what the oxygen level was, right? And then they terminate or cancel entry permits that, that are required. The entry supervisor should verify that the rescue services are available. And that's if you're gonna be using a third party rescue or if in your plan is, you know what, we're in close proximity to the fire department. We've already worked it out with the local fire department. We're gonna call 911. Make sure his phone works is what verify. Or we're gonna use radio channel four. Make sure channel four is operating, right? You should remove, or, or the entry supervisor removes unauthorized individuals who enter or attempt to enter. A lot of this happens with like the general contract. They wanna walk in in the middle of the job because, hey, this is my job and I'm running it and I hired you, but you can't just walk into somebody else's permit required confined space. So that's the entry supervisor keeps them out and then determines when the space operation, basically when we're gonna transfer over the liability to another entity. We're all done, the electricians can get in there. We're all done, the plumbers can get in there, right? So that's what the entry supervisor is going to end up doing. Keep in mind that you do have other hazards. And when they say other hazards, it's things like uh, dangerous surfaces. It's things like falling objects or insects, any biological instances we may be running into. Um, this would be the any other hazards category we kind of talked about, which then can become dangerous, which then is, uh, needs to be thought about a little more. And then looking at this next picture, um, I want you to be able to identify what kind of confined space are we doing? So first of all, I want you to picture it empty. Is it large enough and so configured that a person can bodily enter and perform assigned work? Probably, right? Yes. Is it designed for continuous occupancy? Would somebody live there? Hopefully not. And then the last one, is it has limited or restricted means for entry or exit. That means limited ways to get in and out. Realistically, you're gonna say yes to all three. It is a confined space by definition. Does it require a permit? Well, the permit says, A, it has a hazardous atmosphere. Yeah, maybe not, right? We would have to test with our gas monitor. B, it has an engulfment hazard. I guess it defines what you define as engulf, because if I'm being eaten alive, it feels pretty close to engulfment. Does it have a configuration hazard? Well, kind of, yeah, I got to crawl over a pit and pile of snakes. 
And then remember, OSHA always has that catch-all. Does it have any other serious safety or health hazard? If you answer yes to any of those other four questions, it requires a permit. And the permit is going to say, if you hear maracas, don't get excited for Cinco de Mayo. Uh, it's probably dangerous. Or caution, uh, snakes don't play nice. Hopefully Harry Potter can come talk to these folks. Then you remember, you got to be able to identify the space characteristics. So looking at this space, is it open or is it obstructed? It's realistic. It is very obstructed. Is it elevated or is it non-elevated? That means is it higher than four feet or lower than four feet to access? It's considered non-elevated when you look at it, right? Is it restricted or unrestricted? Is it smaller than 24 inches or wider than 24 inches? It's probably unrestricted, but there are some restrictions that my brain's telling me to stay away from it. This is more of a lucky you live Hawaii, right? Kind of situation. You have got to be able to identify all of the characteristics of the confined space, okay? And then you can go safely work in it, essentially. Congratulations on your successful completion of the confined space training. Now, don't forget to click on that test link below. You are going to include your email and your name so that we can uh, get those certificates printed. Appreciate you guys for joining me. Have a great day.